All right. So this this uh, this is a great photo here. So this is 1986. So I had this flood event, and so I came up and to see who I have this size from the 1986 plus. So they didn't even realize they had all this corrosion going on, and when the water came back down, you could see that they were very lucky that they didn't didn't have a breach. All right, learning objectives for this. Uh, You'll be able to identify river system dynamics, uh, locations where riverine erosion and scour occurred, describe riverbed scour and lateral bank retreat process. A lot of times we talk about riverine erosion, we kind of separate them out in this and scour is kind of like, uh, has to do the riverbed, lateral bank retreat, as it says, is you know, erosion progressing into the, into the river bank, lateral. Uh, identify tools to evaluate scour and lateral erosion and discuss examples of scour and lateral, uh, lateral bank retreat remediation. All right, so overview of a river system. Uh, so you can see here the river starts out up in the mountains. Uh, it's in, we call that the source area. And I think here we use example of Arkansas River. So if you go up I-70 to Copper Mountain to the left of Leadville, you'll see the start of Arkansas River. It's a little trickle of a stream. But then it picks up. And you can see in the source zone, there's usually not a lot of sediment in, in the source zone. So mountain streams are usually clear, right? And so that sediment gets transported away quickly. Uh, then it works its way down and gets into the transfer transport zone, just kind of mid-river. You can see here, you see here, uh, and this is in Muskogee, Oklahoma, as the Arkansas River continues down toward the Mississippi. But this is called the, the transfer zone. So during a flood, you know, you, you get some particles washed away and that is it drops out, new deposits, uh, you know, resettle into that area. So it's, it's kind of a, a dynamic, system where you're both transporting particles and when the flood drops down, you're depositing. And then you get down to the to the mouth of the river. And this is this slide here is where it, where the Arkansas flows into the Mississippi right here. You can see there's just a lot of deposition. The river velocity slow down. You got all that bed load coming in. And it's a more depositional environment. So just it's pretty basic stuff. And so just talking a little bit about river system dynamics. So erosion has an effect on even non levee rivers. Uh, so here they can move in plan, uh, plan form uh, through the erosive forces. So you can see See here, you know, we got the, the meanders as it goes around the bend. The velocities are typical, typically higher. The foul leg of the river usually follows that that that, uh, that bend, so it encroaches on that on that bank and, and causes erosion. And that continues as it meanders. Eventually, this this will get wider and wider. Probably better to show it on here. Uh, eventually, these oxbow lakes get get um, wider and wider, and then they'll start, you know, increasing their sinuosity. Is that the right word? And then they eventually cut themselves off, and then the river is straightened out, and then it starts that cycle over again. Uh, things to note, you know, like you get in some of these dead zones, you'll get uh, deposits where it's uh, in the straight zone sometimes, and the velocity slows out. And then, then you'll get point bars on the inside of the on the inside of the bin where you have more deposition. So that's good things to know when you're looking at a, a levy. Fifteen minutes already. Okay, I better get going then. Wow. Uh, so river system dynamics. So this is an American River uh, plot here. So you can see at forty thousand, the main channel is. And, you know, to to the to the right of the river as it's flowing downstream to the left, and then as it as the flood increases, you can see kind of the uh, the predominant channel is 
kind of redirects over here. Okay, I need to speed up a little bit here. Uh, so human impacts and channel geomorphology. So be aware of this. So levees are often, you know, uh, they cut off natural streams uh, to make the line of protection along the main river. So creeks that are flowing into the river often get cut off by a levee. So sometimes those are uh, an area where you, you need to be concerned because you have that all that alluvium underneath. They'll cut it off probably properly. It can be a, an area for uh, foundation erosion. Uh, Realignment can cause changes in erosion patterns. Uh, this is Sacramento again. So they, the American River used to come in with a big ass here and an out down here and at some point it just set up. Okay, so you know some of those types of things are, are good to note because it changes your foundation, uh, geology, and, and 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 it's good to good to be aware of that. All right, we're going to talk about riverbed scour. So, riverbed scour uh, refers to the natural aggradation or the depositional type of environment or degradation of geomaterials in the riverbed. So, here's a plot of uh, using what we use on that side scan sonar. So, so you can do plots over time that show you the characteristics of the of the river. I think this was between 2006 and 2017. So you can kind of see how the, how the river uh, changes over time, where the potters are and where the scour occurs. Uh, riverbed scour, so, you know, there's a lot of things that we, we talked about, man-made uh, obstructions. So, you know, it can be a, a stone or a pipe. Sometimes they put pipes on the riverbed and put riprap over them. It can cause a hard spot, you get scour, bridge piers, obviously, uh, getting away from the levees more, like on our navigation dams, if you have a uh, barge, barge uh, collision into the gates and you can't operate the gates when that water, when you can't hold cool and the water starts to fall out, a lot of times you get a, a pretty high flow and it can cause scour below the, below the dam. So this is one Manal and I worked on uh, during COVID, I guess. Uh, this lock and dam three on the Mississippi. So for for navigation dams, just know uh, on on all of our major rivers that this is a pretty common issue. And so the, the good thing is that they monitor this frequently. So they usually do a survey every year. So if we notice that it's progressing back towards the dam, we can intervene and put some river up in there to slow that down. That old Frankenstein is also a little soil about a pouring water. So starts to starts to work in this area, removing material from the from the toe, and then uh, you know over steepens the bank, get a tension crack and filtration. Uh, the shearing starts, and you get a ero the eroded bank failures. Occur uh, I'm sorry, bank failure occurs, and then the erosion moves removes the failed debris, and then it starts the cycle again. And then keep in mind, like if you have a combination of vertical scour and lateral brink retreat, that can exacerbate over over steepening of the toe as well. So I have a video here that I want to play. Ah. This is a good example.
place to get All right, I'm going to stop. So just remember that it's always good to have an effective evacuation plan. Minimize life loss. Nobody likes my humor. I thought I'd get a chuckle out of here. <laughs> All right, so common river arena failure modes. So let's talk through those real quick. So we have erosion of the levee foundation below the levee toe. So this is where the initiation starts uh, below the below the toe. And here you can see you will usually reference the land side levee toe as our distinction between foundation and in, embankment erosion. So this starts below the levee toe. A lot of times it'll even start down lower. You know, if you have scour mixed in there too, you need to do a calculation of scour uh, in here that could potentially over uh, over steepen the bank as well uh, before you look at the lateral uh, bank retreat portion. But anyway, uh, I'll quickly go through this. So you have sufficient flow to remove the vegetal cover or channel protection. Uh, erosion develops due to high velocity or a nick point in the surface protrusion into flow, erosion advances to the levee and erodes its foundation. Uh, detection and intervention is unsuccessful. So a lot of times it's pretty pretty hard to intervene on this one because you can't even see the erosion occurring a lot of times. Um, and then breach occurs by global instability or progression through the levee crest. So the next one is similar. Uh, except it starts on the levee itself, so it doesn't require the foundation to, to fail, but it's directly eroding into the into the levee here. So the erosion starts here and it works back, back. So it doesn't have to do as much work if that's the case, right? If you have those conditions and you're just directly eroding into the embankment, usually you don't have to remove as much material to get a failure. And then here's just a uh, reference to the navigation dam or or even uh, flood control dam uh, undermining the stilling basin due to riverbed scour. So I'm going to go through these real quick. You have these in your notes, so those are pretty straightforward. Uh, real quickly, uh, as I said, we've been doing a lot of evaluation on Sacramento River, and uh, you see one of the tools we these are some of the tools we use to do that evaluation. So we had HEC, 2D HECRAS models. Uh, the, of the river, so that was very, very helpful to have that information. Uh, we could do plots. Uh, we could do plots of the uh, velocity across the across the uh, river river uh, cross section. So you could kind of see velocities as they're you know what that velocity is along the uh, levee riverside levee toe and down here along the bank. You know, you, you can pick off those velocities and, and you can kind of do a uh, check and see, hey, where, where is our velocity critical? So the other tools we use, of course, are uh, soils, boring, soil boring, soil material, and geologic information. So geologic cross sections are nice to have, or even using geologic, uh, geologic maps. Uh, very helpful in, in looking at foundation conditions. Uh, so with those two things, once we know the velocity and, and uh, some of the soil information, uh, we use this paper by Fissimus a lot. There's other other uh, other guidance out there on erosion initiation. Uh, I think you guys probably saw some of that in the soil, erosion of soil, rock and soils earlier. Uh, but anyway, this is a good screening tool. So hey, if we we've got really low velocities, we got good grass cover, you know. That sort of thing. We can kind of look on this chart and see where we're at, uh, and so it's a good it's a good screening tool. Just keep in mind that that uh, that chart uh, is for initiation. If you have longer durations, uh, that that kind of threshold. So anyway, it's all in that paper. It's pretty straightforward. It's a good tool to. The screen erosion. So erosion rates so of volume erosion. That's just the direct. Hey, uh, we we have our we have our uh, erodibility co coefficient, and we take that times the 
hydraulic shear stress times the critical or minus the critical shear stress, and that gives us our erosion rate. So that's just straight volume erosion. Uh, when we do estimation, we have uh, when we estimate erosion uh, into the bank. There's a lot of things we need to consider: flow depth and duration, shear stress, velocity, soil type. There might be multiple soil types as shown here. That's kind of why I showed this slide. We often have different layers of, uh, of soil types. Uh, you know, if we have a sandy soil, erosion is probably going to start in that layer. Uh, geometry, if the levee set way back, you know, we have to do we have to remove more material. So, usually in a risk assessment, we're looking at we're looking at uh, we're looking at, you know, how much soil can be re removed in one event to lead to a breach. But yeah, I've only got five minutes here, so I'm going to try to go through this very quickly. Uh, so, factors affecting the erodibility coefficient and the critical shear stress, flat soil plasticity, uh, compaction, consolidation. Soil heterogeneity, uh, wet dry free thaw, armoring, flow intensity and duration. Uh, so there's some tests you can do. I'm running way short on time, and so there's some tests you can do. You can do the uh, uh, jet jet erosion test or the erosion function app apparatus test. So those are, are are ways you can actually get a measurement of some of the erodibility of properties of the soil. Uh, you know, when you get those, it's highly, highly variable. So, you know, there's several tools out there. So I think you look at, you know, the tools available to see how sensitive it is to these. And, and bottom line is you have to really calibrate it to actual field conditions. So these are tools, but at the end of the day, you really need to calculate or calibrate it to, to what's going on. So there's some corrective factors based on hydraulic uh, for hydraulic shear stress, uh, if you have vegetation, if you have like grass cover or wooded wooded area, you can adjust uh, using this man Manning's uh, roughness uh, correction. Uh, I got to go through this quick. All right, uh, approaches. Uh, so riverbed scour calculations. They just put out a new uh, publication just uh, what two years ago. Uh, I think some folks from Erdic and uh, St. Paul District. They were doing a lot of the work on Sacramento as well, so they uh, came up with a new paper uh, on assessing riverine scour. So there's a lot of guidance in there for for riverbed scour. RMC has a toolbox, uh, existing toolbox. It basically calculates volume erosion, uh, and it's pretty straightforward. It's just uh, just linear. Progression back into that sort, but it's very uh, sensitive to the erosion rate. Uh, so that's available, but when we used it, it was very, very sensitive. We just uh, we just don't really didn't really use it much on the American River. So USDA came out with new methods of analysis uh, for incorporating both. Uh, volumetric erosion and bank stability. So it's an iterative process. So as we showed in our lateral bank retreat cycle, uh, you know, when you get that erosion down at the toe, it oversteepens the bank, and, and then you get a slope uh, stability failure and, and you get that mass wasting like we saw in the Yellowstone uh, flood event. And so this is the model the best model the way we have to use. And I'm trying to get a class together on that uh, with the RMC uh, pulling something together on this because this is the best best uh, best tool we have to evaluate riverine erosion. So don't have a lot of time here or go into it a little bit more. Uh, but anyway, it, it basically uh, Tiffany went through the slope stability stuff. So it kind of uses uh, when it over steepens the bank, it kind of reevaluates, you know, it gets to a certain erosion rate on that toe, over steepens it, then it does a slope stability calculation. And if it fails, uh, it takes away that wedge and then kind of start the cycle over again. So here's some results from BSIM. So we 
use these a lot in our evaluation of the levees. As you see, if the levees set back further from the riverbank, it's it's a good thing. But it gives you, you know, probabilistic uh, outcomes as to how the uh, riverbank retreat may occur. So 50th percentile would be your like most likely case. And then, you know, a lot of times if it got into the levee prism, you know, uh, it didn't start start getting worried, you know. So, like, uh, if that erosion occurs, you get into the levee, levee prism, which when we say levee prism, that's kind of like the design prism. So, you know, you may have overbuild that may be taller than they designed for, maybe lower than they designed for. But when you get into that prism, then that's when the when stability, instability starts to occur and the threat in the levee. Uh, so, like I said earlier, so I think incorporate and uh, scour conditions into or predictions into B stem. So, if you're going to run that lateral bank study and you think you're going to have scour, so you need to run that first and then put that geometry in into B stem uh, to make sure you've got an accurate picture. Lone tree scour. So, this is the one we're working at on our working on on uh, California levees. No, this is a concern at some. So when you have this, the, the thing of it is, it's pretty pretty close to the levee crest, and so when you have low tree scour, uh, you know it can it can act quickly and unravel the, the levee quickly. Uh, so it's it's something to be aware of. You know, it could be a, a pole or a bridge pier or something in the levee as well. So, but anyway, take into account those effects too. And there's some quite are there some good guidance on that. Uh, Want to finish off with risk informed design uh, for levees. So, the challenge on the California levees was you know, you want to provide protection to prevent erosion, but you, know, you don't want to put 10 feet of riprap every year. So, you try to make the design where it's environmentally accessible. And so, we didn't. So that that was part of the challenge on this one. We looked at a lot of environmentally friendly designs where they incorporated tree planting. Uh, sometimes they use rock underneath. Sometimes they use no rock at all, which is planted and, and that sort of thing. So it was. So we were trying to to meet the ECD requirements of having a levy risk in order of magnitude less than um, bridge risk. So that's that's in our ECD guns. And so we didn't want to, you know, be three orders of magnitude. We want to be just enough to provide a, a level of protection and, you know, make sure it would operate um, in any in our design plan. I think I'm about done here. So there's some good publications. So hopefully you guys have this in your uh, slide deck. But here's some good. Publications on and guidelines on soil bioengineering. And so I think we're going to see more and more of this. Or you know, understood. And, you know, I think we're going to have more requirements to do environmentally friendly uh, remediation rather than just put a stone on the Anyway, that's kind of a story I went through quick. You need to be that you need to be incremental in case to be able to apply these points. I think it will get more data, so it will help. 